Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of having Lauren with us. Lauren is a 24-year-old who has never smoked and recently lost most of her right lung to cancer. Since her lobectomy in March, she has been racing 5Ks and climbing mountains on the east and west coast. She aims to end the stigma around lung cancer um, and spread the word that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. And she's joining us today with the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative to, to share her story. Lauren, thank you so much for your time and your willingness to be here with us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you guys. <laughs> awesome. So to introduce myself, my team, uh, my name is Priyanka, and with me I have Drake, and we are part of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, or ALSI for short. And for those who might not be familiar with our organization, we have just a couple of slides to share about who we are. ALSI is a 501c3 nonprofit that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. We are a team of over 200 students and doctors located across the United States. And we do the work that we do because lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. Lung cancer causes about 380 deaths per day in the U.S. alone. Lung cancer is very fatal because currently many patients are being diagnosed at a late stage when the cancer has grown and spread to other parts of the body. Lung cancer screening is an effective imaging technique that can be used to screen for lung cancer and has been shown to catch lung cancers early. However, less than 6% of people at high risk for lung cancer are currently getting screened. And the screening rate for lung cancer is much lower than the screening rates for breast, cervical, and colon cancers, which are about 70%. We believe that educating people about lung cancer and lung cancer screening is one of the most important and effective ways to increase the lung cancer screening rate for populations that would benefit from lung cancer screening. So far, we've given over 140 presentations on lung cancer and lung cancer screening to universities, hospitals, medical schools, and organizations around the US, as well as India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, reaching over 10,000 people. And over the last year, we worked with over 140 mayors from every single US state to issue proclamations recognizing November as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we've also had the opportunity to work with several leaders at the state level, including Arizona State Senator Leela Alston, who's a lung cancer survivor, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, and Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, Diane Pimawera, to, to increase awareness about lung cancer screening. And in addition to our education, outreach, and advocacy efforts, we recently started a podcast series to share the personal side of lung cancer and provide a platform for lung cancer survivors and advocates to share their stories. ALSI also worked with U.S. Congress members and senators to draft and advocate for the first ever House and Senate resolutions, recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. And in December 2020, the Senate res resolution was passed with unanimous consent, marking the first time the U.S. Senate has ever recognized the importance of screening. And ALSI has also actively been working with Representative Brendan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act of 2021. Lastly, we want to end by talking a little bit about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using a low-dose computed tomography scan. And this scan uses low radiation doses, is pain-free, and takes less than five minutes to complete. The United States Preventive Services Task Force, also known as the USPSTF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now, they recommend that people between the ages of 50 and 80 who have a 20-pack year smoking history or more, and who are current or former smokers who within the past 15 years get annual low-dose CT scans. And one pack year is defined as smoking on average one pack a day for one year, and therefore 20 pack years can be met in a multitude of ways, including smoking one pack a day for 20 years or smoking two packs a day for 10 years, for example. If you know anyone who might be eligible for a lung cancer screening based on the criteria listed on the previous slide, please share the link given by the QR code so that they can get in contact with one of our doctors about lung cancer screening. And finally, we wanna highlight there are other risk factors for lung cancer in addition to smoking, such as exposure to asbestos, a family history of lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. We believe that it's important that we recognize these additional risk factors because a large number of people in the United States who have never smoked still get lung cancer. So thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to that short presentation. And without further ado, we'll jump right into the podcast. We have a few questions prepared for Lauren, but we also have a Q&A session at the end where we will ask 
um, her questions that we received from our listeners earlier. So first off, Lauren, um, could you please introduce yourself and share your background? Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm 24. I'm a non-smoker um, who's recently been just diagnosed with lung cancer back in January. Um, and like you said earlier, I had lost the lower and middle uh, lobes of my right lung. Um, but I'm doing okay now. I'm an outdoor educator in New Hampshire. And yeah. Great. Thanks, Lauren, for, um, for the introduction. Could you talk, if you feel comfortable, could you talk more about your lung cancer journey? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I was diagnosed back in January, but I really started to get sick um, a couple years ago. Um, when I was about 12, I kind of grew into asthma when everybody else I knew was growing out of asthma. Um, and so from that point on, I kept getting bronchitis and pneumonia and everyone just kept telling me, take your inhaler, take this um, antibiotic. Um, and within the last year or so, um, I just couldn't catch my breath at all. I started having a chronic wheeze. Um, I kept, I was on four bouts of antibiotics within a month and um, nothing was getting better. So I finally went to the hospital after having like 103 degree fever one day. And um, they found out that my lung was collapsed, but told me it would get better. Um, and finally I got a CAT scan done and um, we found the tumor. Um, and then I got a bronchoscopy and um, I was diagnosed back in January when I was working. Um, I was teaching a bunch of four-year-olds and I got an email that told me that my tumor had tested positive for cancer. Um, so it was kind of just going from there. What was that experience like when you received your lung cancer diagnosis and what was going through your mind, especially since you received it over email? Yeah, I was very shocked when I saw the email. I had assumed that um, the email was probably like, oh, I missed a medical bill that I need to pay. So I was just checking how much I owe. And then it said like your tumor tested positive for CD95, I believe it was. And um, I immediately felt like someone had punched me in the stomach. Um, I wasn't really shocked because I was going around for a month or so, or so just saying, I think I have lung cancer. You know, I have nine out of the 10 symptoms. Um, but now that it was finally in concrete writing, um, I remember just kind of falling back to the ground and I felt like as small as my four-year-olds, um, did at then. And I just wanted my mom and, um, yeah, it was definitely a strange, surreal experience. You touched upon this a little bit, but could you talk more about, um, in what ways your life changed after being diagnosed with lung cancer? Yeah. Um, so with any type of cancer, any bad news, your life completely just, everything changes. Like everything I see now, I think cancer, like everything I do, um, especially with my lungs, I'm breathing. And I am just definitely more aware of every breath that I took for granted. Everything that I do subconsciously was breathing. And now I feel every breath that I take. Um, I just feel like, I remember crying the first night that I got the diagnosis. And I obviously I still cry once in a while, but, um, it's definitely a feeling of having to be strong and regroup yourself for all the other people around you too, because that's the one thing people don't tell you about cancer is that you have to be so strong for everyone else in your life as well. Um, yeah, I would say my cancer diagnosis, I'm not thankful for it, but I'm definitely feel like I have a more um, resilient outlook on everything in my life now and that, hey, I've gone through this and I can keep moving forward. Um, if you feel comfortable sharing, um, did you experience any complications um, or side effects following your um, lobectomy? Yeah, so I had um, some pleurisy going on, which is um, like inflammation in your lungs. And um, when I went in for my two week scan um, or x-ray, there was still like water retention, like all where they took my lung out, um, which is kind of gone away still, but um, I'm still feeling like some buildup. Um, I had no nerve um feeling at all on like my right side or my stomach um which is slowly coming back now after five months and um it's definitely painful now and um I'm still experiencing a lot of wheezing and difficult breathing and everything which hopefully will get better 
Um, but I have been um, running and doing 5Ks and hiking and everything. So I feel like I'm in pretty good shape um, for most people with lung cancer. Well, that's great to hear. We're, we're really happy for you, Ryan. So what advice would you have um, to give to someone newly diagnosed with lung cancer um, about what questions they should ask or, um, or just in general, what questions they should ask um, their PCP or, or doctor when they receive uh, a diagnosis like that of lung cancer? Um, so every cancer diagnosis is completely different. So my what I would ask my PCP is completely different than what someone else should ask. Um, but definitely follow up on your scans, your x-rays, what are the next steps? Um, what should you be preparing for? Because sometimes I feel like I wasn't prepared for the, they tell you all about the physical aspects that's gonna happen. They're gonna remove your lung, they're gonna do this, but they don't tell you about how the emotional aspect. So I think definitely trying to get your mind and frame is the number one thing um, to, keep, to keep doing this because it's the mind body connection almost. And if you have a strong mind and you're willing to get better and recover and not after your surgery, um, just sit on the couch and just feel sorry for yourself, then um, you're gonna be in a lot better shape. Um, I would definitely ask your PCP though, or anyone, your oncologist, just for resources and what you can do or who can help. Um, and um, I found a lot of support online, actually, on Instagram. I had a lot of people reach out to me, and I've made some really awesome friends through there. After um, receiving your diagnosis, how willing were you to share this, this dark time, this diagnosis with other people in your life, um, whether that be your family or colleagues? I shared it almost immediately. I felt like um, even before my diagnosis, um, when I kind of knew I had the tumor, but I didn't know it was positive for cancer yet, I was sharing everything about radon because I live in New Hampshire. They have a high radon level um, just because I, I thought that's what caused it, but it wasn't. Um, but anyways, like when I, the day I found out I had my tumor, I immediately put like so much radon awareness stuff out just because I wanted everyone in my life to go test their houses um, in New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And um, I'm very open to talk about everything and anything about my cancer. Um, and even if people don't want to hear about it, I will still just tell them and um, just post stuff online all the time. So you touched upon this a little bit earlier, but you talked about the emotional aspect of being diagnosed with lung cancer. And so what are some strategies uh, that you use to get through particularly hard times or difficult times? Um, I would say just knowing that I'm still here and luckily my diagnosis was caught um, when I was young. They said my tumor was probably growing for like 10 years, but um, I'm young enough that luckily I had an easy operation. Um, and I would say getting up and moving. Um, I think like within 24 hours of my operation, I was up and walking the halls of the hospital just to get up and keep moving and just not feeling down about yourself you can feel down about the situation because cancer is horrible no one wants it but you can't get mad at yourself or um as frustrated as you feel you are i think it's just important to just keep going and just knowing things are going to get better and the more you stay back and stagnant you're never going to move forward did you have any misconceptions about lung cancer um, prior to being diagnosed um, I think everyone does because in high school we're taught, you know, to get lung, you can prevent lung cancer by not smoking. Um, at least I was, everyone just thinks you have to be like 40, 50, 60, 70 and smoke every single day since you were 16. Um, but I've never smoked a cigarette. I'm not exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, my radon levels are okay. I'm not exposed to asbestos. So how do I have cancer, lung cancer? So it's just kind of expectations you know, it's, it's different um, and anything can happen. I think that's such an important um, topic to just focus on is that not a lot of people realize that um, even those individual individuals who don't smoke or have um, a heavy pack your smoking history are still able to get lung cancer. And um, one thing that we like is that, you know, anyone with lungs can get lung cancer and no one deserves it. Mm -hmm. And um, the proportion of individuals in the U.S. who are diagnosed with lung cancer and haven't smoked is 10 to 20 percent. So it's quite a large proportion of individuals 
um, diagnosed with lung cancer who uh, who haven't smoked. And I think that a strong association between lung cancer and smoking um, has contributed to the stigma, unfortunately, that exists around lung cancer. And it's just so important that we educate people that there are other risk factors like exposure to secondhand smoke, um, a family history of lung cancer, and as, as you mentioned, exposure to radon and asbestos, these other risk factors that can also um, that can also cause lung cancer. And so that's, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I think it's just so important that we educate people about, um, about that. Oh, definitely. I think every single person I've met with lung cancer has never smoked a day in their life. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So before um, being diagnosed with lung cancer, had you heard of lung cancer screening? Um, and if, if you had, did you have any concerns about um, getting screened for lung cancer? I had never heard of it and I didn't have any concerns whatsoever because I don't have a family history. I have no reason to have a concern for it. Um, so it was definitely very interesting when I had to, you know, when all of a sudden my lung collapsed and I, I was getting all these tests done and everything. Um, yeah, I just never had a reason to, to know about it until it happened to me. So just a follow up to that question, um, could you talk a little bit about what the process of getting a lung cancer screening exam is like? Um, so mine was, um, it wasn't like a typical screening. I had to, so they got the chest x-ray with the collapsed lung and then I did uh, multiple CAT scans and then I did a lot of breathing tests, like six different machines that I had to breathe into and then um, a PET scan. And that's been my screening process and multiple x-rays in between um, them. And what motivates you to share your lung cancer story publicly and what really inspired you to create that Instagram account? Um, so my Instagram account is just my personal Instagram account that I just post everything on. Um, but I definitely do post a lot of lung cancer stuff on it now. Um, and I just feel like I am young and I'm like the opposite of a lung cancer, a stereotypical person with lung cancer. Um, I, I mean, I was, I'm 24. I, I'm active. I'm an outdoor educator. I'm climbing mountains. I'm hiking. I'm biking. Everything. Um, I eat healthy. It just. I feel like I just needed to let people know that if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer. It's. It's not. It doesn't have a bias. It doesn't have any prejudice against anyone else. It just. It doesn't have any malintentions to the people it attacks. It just happens. It doesn't get to pick and choose. Cancer just happens. And I definitely feel like with my age, we need to end that misconception that it, it's an older person's disease or a smoker's illness. It's it's not. It's anyone's illness. Definitely. And in your experience um, and in your opinion, what do you believe are some of the most effective ways for us to raise awareness about lung cancer and um, and talk about some of the common misconceptions that people have? Um, so I think everything you... Um, said at the beginning with the slideshow was was excellent. I think we need to get screening. I think we need to talk to our um, state leaders and raise the awareness no matter what you do or how or anything, just get the word out that, you know, lung cancer is the most deadliest cancer. I mean, we see all like these pink ribbons for breast cancer, but we never see the white ribbon. Like, in, I know it's because women are the most, most likely to get breast cancer and women are loud in your face all the time. And, um, but we need to see that white ribbon. It's the most deadliest cancer and we never see it. And um, we need to get it screening to be as mandatory as like your mammograms are or your colonoscopies are, or your pap smears are or anything. It needs to be there. I mean, everyone has lungs. Not everyone, you know, has all these other things we're screening for. And especially now with more and more pollutions going into the environment and into the air, I think we need to really start thinking about our breathing and everything we take for granted with just a simple breath. We all touched on this um, before, but what are some of the current challenges that the lung cancer community faces? I think it's definitely not enough outreach or not enough awareness. And I think we definitely need to um, just get the word out that it's happening. It's on the rise. I read somewhere it's on the rise. Um, in a lot of women and decreasing in males. So I wanted, I want to know what that's about. Um, or even if that's true, I don't even remember where I read that from, but um, 
I think we need to go to high schools and even middle schools or whatever, or colleges, and just spread the word, hey, you can get lung cancer. You know, it's not just because of the cigarettes we're telling you not to smoke. It's from other reasons, and you need to be aware of it. And for someone who has a loved one um, who might have recently been diagnosed with lung cancer, do you have any advice for them on how they can best support and help the patient? Um, definitely check in on them. It's always good to hear like, hey, how are you? How are you feeling? Um, but I definitely wouldn't go overbearing. People will open up and share their story when they're ready to. Um, but again, some people need to be pried at and be like, hey, you need to talk about this. Maybe offer them, what can I do? Can I go to the grocery store for you today? Hey, you look like you're having a bad day. Can I make you a cup of tea? Can I, what, I'm here to support you. What can I do? Communication is definitely the key to any relationship, including that with um, someone in their cancer or someone and someone who has cancer. It's all about opening up that space and making that feel safe for them um, and giving them a safe place to come home to maybe after work or something because it's not it's not easy it's on your mind 24 7 so when you come home you don't always want to talk about um, your lung cancer or sometimes you do sometimes you want to just be like hey today was a really bad day I couldn't breathe and uh, let me open it up and don't just shove them off and just say hey maybe in five minutes maybe in like you know like how give them that space to talk and um, resources if you have any and if it is someone who smokes, just remember, like, people don't, people who, like, have that addiction to cigarettes, it's an addiction, and they don't choose to have that addiction. They might want to quit and just can't, and it's, um, so don't blame them for their cancer, you know? No one wants to get it, no one tries to get it, it just, again, it happens. Having cancer changes so much about your life um, in general. I'm sure like many people would not think that you'd be out running 5Ks and being a fitness instructor after having most of your right um, lung removed. Um, so what words of wisdom do you have for people post-cancer as far as being able to live a full life once more? I would say just keep moving. I mean, there's... I really don't know what's, I mean, the best medicine for your lungs is fresh air and breathing. And, you know, and if you broke your arm, you know, you go to physical therapy to get that strong, to strengthen your lungs, you breathe, you know, and if it was any type of cancer, just know you're, you're over the worst of it, hopefully. And um, things do get better. And there are a lot of resources out there and a lot of great people. And the cancer community is honestly just full of such strong and wonderful people. And I would say reach out and we're all willing to accept you into the community to talk and everything. So just as a, um, just jumping off of um, what you had just mentioned um, that you found a lot of support online, what are um, some resources or support groups that you would recommend um, to lung cancer patients? Are there like any, any groups that um, come to mind in particular? Yeah. Um, so my friend, um, so when I first found out I had cancer, I think I posted something on Instagram and within like 20 seconds, I think someone reached out to me and her name was Katie. And um, she then um, told me I needed to go get a white ribbon from the white ribbon project. So I ended up getting involved with the white ribbon project and um, someone came and gave me my ribbon and then someone else from the white ribbon project in that community who also had lung cancer said, hey, um, there's a 5K in the area. Do you want to go with me? And I'm like, okay. So we went and met up at the 5K. And then the same thing happened um, a couple months later with Heidi and Pierre, who um, founded the White Ribbon Project. Um, they were coming to my state um, to do a 5K. And so I went and did a 5K with them. And it's just been, I would definitely say the White Ribbon Project is a great community. And I love how it just symbolizes and just brings everyone together. Like we all have this ribbon, it's all made with love, it's all given with love and it's received with love. And it's just a unified symbol that just kind of connects all of us together. Um, and this October, um, I'm gonna be doing a like white ribbon project, um, like ribbon painting and making a party kind of thing to kind of get more people in the community involved. Yeah, we've had the honor of being able to um, talk with Heidi and Pierre and, and they they were actually on one of our earlier podcasts and um, 
just want to um, really emphasize exa everything that you said, the White Room Project is such a wonderful community um, that they're helping to, to build ribbons and deliver them to anyone who, who wants them. I think it's a great way to raise awareness. And as you mentioned before, a lot of people know that the pink ribbons for um, people know that, you know, the pink ribbon represents um, breast cancer and breast cancer awareness. And we see a lot of those pink ribbons um, in the month of October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but we don't see the same type of um, support or focus um, for November, which is Lung Cancer Awareness Month with the white ribbons. And I think what the White Ribbon Project is doing is just phenomenal and trying to get a community um, community together. So please, uh, for our listeners, please do check out their um, their website. And if you're if you want to get involved, they have lots of opportunities um, and events in different communities that you can look into. And so I think this is our last question um, that we have for you, Lauren, but we do have some questions from the audience as well. Um, but if you had to sum up your journey in one sentence, what would that be? I don't know, that's tough. That's tough to think of on the spot. Um, I would sum it up and I, can I say it in one word? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. I would say <laughs> resilience or resiliency, just because, again, you have to be strong for yourself, strong for your body, and then strong for everyone around you, and um, it's tough, and you can't miss a beat, but you you figure out a way to, to make it work, and you find those around you who will support you with it. Um, thank you so much, Lauren, uh, for taking time out of your day to share your story with us. Now, I would like to open the floor for our participants to ask you any questions they may have regarding you or your story, and if you feel comfortable answering them. So if you guys would like to ask uh, Lauren a question, please put it in the chat or unmute. Awesome. So I think we have a question from uh, Emmanuel. Uh, they say, uh, I have a question for Lauren. Um, I, I, so following your story from the beginning, you seem to have kept a happy demeanor with your diagnosis. Is this true um, or how do you stay so resilient? Um, I would say I definitely stay resilient by, again, just being out, outside is my happy space. So I'm outside all the time. Um, being outside, my dog definitely helps. Um, my family has been helping me by just kind of being there for me for these 5Ks, they'll show up. Um, there was one 5K that I went to go run and I left my house by myself. And then as I'm coming across the finish line, I see my mom's car pulling up. Like she came to surprise me at the finish line, which was really sweet. And um, I would say just knowing that I, that I can share my unique story to the world kind of keeps me resilient and um, keeps going just because it's a weird situation. And um, I just know if I share my story, it could definitely help more people. And I think that's what motivates me to be happy and resilient and keep going. Um, I received a question. Um, aside from the work that you're currently doing with the White Ribbon Project, um, are you doing anything else with any other lung cancer communities? And can you describe some of the things you're currently doing in the lung cancer um, field? Yeah, so I'm not um, doing anything with anyone else right now, just because, again, it's been five months, but um, I'm definitely open to anyone in any program that needs me. Um, I did run um, a shoe drive for four months um, with the local high school and then a daycare center and a whole bunch of different places um, to try to spread awareness and help their like Project Hope um, clubs there and we raised um I think right now we have like five to 500 to like 700 pairs of shoes in my garage right now which well then I'll get money for to give to lung cancer um research and everything so um I'm hoping to do that next year again and I've been invited to go and talk to different high schools um about my um, lung cancer journey and ways that not to prevent it but how it happens and what we can do to change the stigma around lung cancer. Okay, and I, I have another question as well. This person says, I have family members who are eligible for a lung cancer screening, but they're worried about the false positive rate and radiation exposure. Could you talk more about um, these two topics? Yes, so I am a twin sister and my twin, um, 
was very much in denial about going to go get screened or getting at least an x-ray or getting anything done. Um, and just because of the radon expo the radiation exposure. And um, what I told her was that if it is cancer, you know, you're gonna have to get radi you might have to get radiation. Or if it is something else, you might have, if you broke a bone, you're gonna get an x-ray. You know, you're gonna be exposed to that radiation and you're not gonna think twice about it. How many people go in with a broken arm and just go, okay, get an x-ray done, you know? They don't think twice, but when it comes to cancer, it's such a scary word that nobody wants to take that risk. And I would tell them that it's better that you know than you don't know, because if you catch it early, you are in a lot better shape than someone who catches it a lot farther down the line because you didn't want to get screened. I would say get that screen done and technology has come so far now that um, it's safe, you know, it's not safe, safe, but it's, it's better than it was before. And it's only going to keep getting better. So get screened and just know that if you get that positive result that, you know, doctors are handling it and science has come so far that it's going to be okay. Great. Thank you for that. That was a great answer. Uh, and then we have another question uh, from Emmanuel. They ask, I don't know anything about housing insulation or radon. Do they still use radon and other harmful materials? Um, so radon is a gas that's kind of found in um, the dirt and stone and rocks. So that's why New Hampshire has such a high rate because we're the granite state. Um, so, but it is a lot of times found in inner cities. Um, my friend was just telling me he has a nonprofit group in Massachusetts in a city and um, his building is extremely high radon level. So it's found in a lot of cities and in urban um, rural areas too. So um, I would say that it's not that they still use it, but it's just found naturally in the environment. Yeah, I think that's that's perfect. And just to, for any any people who are listening who are looking to get their house tested for radon, I can um, just like talk briefly about the process. That, but the typical test is very simple and inexpensive. There are test kits that can be purchased at, at basically any home improvement store or hardware store or even online. And they cost just about 20 to $30. Um, and it's, it's very simple to test uh, your house for radon. Um, the the testing kit is usually like the size of about a hockey puck and it has perforated holes and charcoal inside. And so you just open it um, and you leave it in one of the lower level, um, like room or lower levels of the house and you just let it sit for a couple of days and then um, you send it off to a lab for testing and you'll get your results that way. And there are certain um, areas within the US that are known to be at, known to have higher levels of radon. And there's a sheet, um, a spreadsheet created by the EPA um, that I can drop uh, in the chat or, or that you can find on the um, EPA's website with, that has um, the radon levels in different zones. So that's I have it. my radon kit. It's right over there somewhere. Um, and it actually like tells you the levels that you have, like the long-term average, the short-term average. So I definitely suggest getting some of those, um, especially if you have a finished basement that I hang out in all the time, you know, so. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that you spoke to um, high schools and middle schools about your lung cancer journey. So how do you best believe that we can educate the upcoming generation about lung cancer screening and lung cancer? Um, just, I would just like it to be normalized, as normalized as like your pap smear colonoscopies and mammograms are. Just normalize it, this, the screening pro um, process, especially those who have asthma that's long-term that you don't grow out of asthma. I think if you know, my brother grew out of asthma when he was in middle school. So if you're still suffering from asthma all the way up until like high school, go and get screened. I feel like we need to lower that age and um, just make it so just end the stigma around it being a smoker's disease is really what I want to focus on as of right now, because I feel like everyone I've talked to is just like, well, how much do you, did you smoke? And I'm just like, never did, you know, so just end that stigma. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Lauren. Um, but this wraps up our Q&A portion of our podcast. Um, but we thank you so much for your willingness to share your story and perspective on many of the pressing issues in the lung cancer community. And we appreciate the work that you're doing to help raise awareness about lung cancer. 
Um, and thank you everyone for joining our podcast. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming podcasts and events, which will be listed on our website, www.alc.org. We also encourage you to join our monthly newsletter where we will share updates on upcoming projects within our organization. Please fill out this Google form if you'd like to be added to this mailing list. And before we end this, we also would like to offer a brochure highlighting some key information about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. If you find this helpful or know of anyone who might benefit from the information included in the brochure, feel free to share it. Um, thank you, Lauren, um, and have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thanks, everyone.